So good evening, and uh, thanks, Liz, for inviting me to this wonderful um, symposium. I took this photograph um, on October 20, 1991. And this dark cloud you can see here is, in fact, smoke. Smoke from the fires from Oakland and Berkeley. I visited friends um, that day, and it was really dramatic. I will never forget this day. And folks here from the San Francisco area probably will also remember that day. Um, I start by, uh, by talking about two phenomena related to acute stress. On the one hand, we know that stress can increase memory. If you had survived this accident here, for example, or the Oakland fires, you will probably never forget it. On the other hand, acute stress can also impair memory. Just look at this poor guy here in this stressful exam situation. He has learned for weeks and now has problems to recall what he has learned. Now, what are the neurobiological factors contributing to this um, phenomenon? Seminal work by Jim McGaugh and uh, Benno Rosendahl has shown that acute stress via the release of glucocorticoids and norepinephrine can enhance the consolidation, so the formation of new memory. This has been shown in rodents, but also in humans, uh, replicated by several uh, groups. Now, on the other hand, we have found that acute stress also, via the release of glucocorticoids and norepinephrine, can uh, impair the retrieval of already stored information. And I think it's important to realize that a certain condition, but also a certain molecule, if you want, can have opposite uh, effects on memory depending on the phase that is affected. And it can even have, uh, happen at the same time. This guy here has problems to recall under stress, but uh, this information here will be stored really well to memory. He will probably have very intensive memory even years later of this embarrassing moment. So these two uh, processes can happen at the same time. Now, what are these glucocorticoid effects good for? Um, enhanced consolidation of em uh, emotionally arousing information is an adaptive mechanism which helps us to retain important information, good and bad. And reduced memory retrieval may support this process and may actually also uh, help to, to suppress uh, um, memories that are unwanted or perhaps even maladaptive. Now, one condition with extremely aversive memory, memory retrieval, is post-traumatic stress disorder. And we thought maybe we can, if, if glucocorticoids inhibit memory retrieval, maybe they also inhibit the retrieval of aversive memories, traumatic memories. So we made a, a pilot study, and here are the results of one patient, a 50-year-old male who survived a terrorist attack four and a half years before inclusion into the study. And we uh, observed him over three months. The first month he received daily placebo medication, then in a double-blind uh, fashion switch to cortisol. The last month was without medication. And you can see the drop in, uh, in his uh, daily symptoms of traumatic memories. We also looked at the effects of glucocorticoids in another anxiety disorder, in phobias, because we thought maybe glucocorticoids not only impair the retrieval of traumatic memory, but also of fear memory in phobias. And the first study we did was in patients with social phobia. And what we found is that the signal administration of cortisone, 25 milligrams, uh, reduces subjective fear in response to social stress test. Yet in another study in patients with spider phobia, we found that repeated administration of cortisol significantly reduced uh, the response to the fear response to a spider photograph as compared to the placebo group. And uh, very recently, we found that the fear-reducing effect of glucocorticoids in patients with uh, spider phobia is characterized 
by reduction of brain activity in memory-related regions, including the parahippocampal gyrus, which you can see here in red. So that's um, how we think that glucocorticoids may, may actually act in anxiety disorders. So normally you have uh, an aversive memory trace, uh, being it uh, a traumatic memory in PTSD or uh, fear memory and phobias, which is uh, re reactivated by an aversive cue normally, and you have the clinical symptoms, re-experiencing phobic fear, and this is again consolidated into memory and further cements the memory trace. Now, we think that glucocorticoids uh, inhibit the retrieval or the reactivation of this memory trace, leading to less symptoms and, of course, uh, less will be reconsolidated, but an extinction memory actually is formed. And here, glucocorticoids can act a second time because it's known from animal studies that glucocorticoids enhance the consolidation of extinction memory. So here, actually, we have another positive effect of glucocorticoids. Finally, the two leading to a facilitation of memory extinction. Now this, in fact, would be perfect to combine with behavioral therapy, which is based on memory extinction. And we did that in this study here um, in patients with fear of heights. That's not me, by the way. I'm also a little bit afraid from heights. So we have chosen a safer environment, a virtual reality environment. But that works also pretty well. Uh, I was scared uh, wearing that helmet and looking down. Um, so it's also used in clinical practice. Um, we used three uh, virtual reality sessions, 20-minute sessions, and uh, had the patients um, swallow placebo tablets one hour before the session or a cortisone tablet before the session. And what we observed is that, first of all, in red, uh, the placebo condition, so the three exposure sessions work, fear goes down, uh, three days post, and also 30 days post. But if it's combined with cortisol, indeed, we had a, a better success. Uh, the the uh, virtual re reality therapy was more successful. Very recently, we were also interested if glucocorticoids have any effects in addiction, because there is it's kind of an addiction memory. And if you think that glucocorticoids may also reduce extinction, uh, uh, addiction memory, then it may actually reduce craving in these patients. And, uh, and so in Switzerland, we have a very special situation. We, we, we treat pe patients with heroin. Uh, they have their daily heroin dose under medical control. And uh, so we did a study and administered uh, cortisol here at baseline. And 60 minutes later, you see, as compared to, to placebo, and 90 minutes afterwards, craving was reduced. And here, in between, they received their daily dose of heroin. And even uh, after the dose of heroin, cortisol reduced craving feelings in these patients. Now I switch to genetics, uh, because in the last couple of years, it became evident that, um, that uh, genetics can be used to identify memory-related genes. So here, that was an example where we identified uh, a gene called Kipra, because it's expressed in kidney and brain, uh, which was related to episodic memory performance in healthy subjects. More recently, we got also interested in the genetics of emotional memory. So emotional arousing events are recalled better than neutral events. That's a well-known phenomenon, and it's true for both positive and negative information as compared to neutral information. Now, we have already seen that the memory-enhancing effect of emotional arousal depends on the activation of the noradrenergic transmission within the brain. And we therefore looked at the, at the adrenergic receptor, the alpha-2b adrenergic receptor, because there's a well-known deletion variant there. And we recruited some 435 healthy young Swiss subjects. We showed them pictures, neutral pictures, positive pictures, negative pictures, and later on they had to recall, to free recall them. And subjects who did not have this deletion variant, which is mostly the case, 
uh, remember about 45% more positive photographs than neutral ones, and also about 45% more negative than neutral ones. So this is this normal memory-enhancing effect of emotional arousal. But if you have a deletion variant, you remember almost as double as many emotional pictures, with no effect, no difference for neutral pictures. Now, because the deletion uh, variant is related to enhanced emotional memory in healthy subjects, it may actually also predispose uh, to stronger traumatic uh, memory when something terrible happens. And this question we investigated in a population and survivors of the Rwandan genocide and found that also here the deletion variant was related to more traumatic memories so as in the healthy populations with more emotional memories. And then again, we did a study in healthy subjects uh, to look at uh, neuroimaging data. And we found that here, uh, deletion carriers showed more activation in the amygdala uh, while viewing emotional pictures. And the amygdala is well known to be important in mediating this memory enhancing effect of emotional arousal. These days, we are uh, most interested in the question whether we can use genomic information to identify molecular or genetic underpinnings of certain memory processes, and perhaps also to find new targets for, for uh, memory modulating drugs. And we started uh, with a study where we took aversive memory as the starting phenotype for the genetic study. So basically, how many of such aversive pictures can be remembered. And we identified uh, the neuroactive ligand receptor interaction pathway, which is a large pathway as important for this trait. And there uh, we found that the gene encoding the histamine receptor H1 is one of possible uh, drug targets. It's not the most interesting one, of course. It's a well-known drug, uh, this diphenhydramine, an anti-allergic drug, which binds there. Uh, but we were interested in this because we could do a trial right on. Um, we can buy it in Switzerland, and uh, we did a trial, and what we found is the following, that a single administration of this diphenhydramine reduced uh, recall of aversive memory, but had no effect on positive uh, and also no effect on neutral material, as the genetic data suggested. And very recently, we also um, started to look at another phenotype as a starting point for genetic studies, brain imaging, brain activation. So what you see here in green are clusters where the activity correlates significantly with uh, memory performance. And we extracted uh, the activation of these clusters from each of our roughly 1,000 individuals we had and subjected that to the genomic analysis. And what we found was very interesting. We saw that uh, a distinct, that actually we have a distinct molecular profile for different brain regions. For example, in the hippocampus cluster, we find protein kinases, growth factors, ABC transporters, while in the cingulate, uh, we find G-protein coupled receptors and ion channels. So we really hope that uh, the combination of behavioral and imaging phenotypes uh, with genome information will promote the identification of, no of novel memory modulating drugs. Drugs to improve memory, but under certain conditions also drugs to inhibit or reduce extremely aversive memories in case of post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. Now, I would like to thank uh, the folks from my lab and uh, Andreas Papositropoulos, with whom I shared the genetic studies and his lab, and uh, many collaborators in the first row, James McGobb and Rosenthal, with whom I share many of the stress studies, and also Iris Colas and Thomas Elbert, with whom I share the African studies. Thanks for listening. <laughs>